I'm black. And now we have to figure some other variables. It depends on population size. How many mice are there in the population? And it depends on something called the selection coefficient. We denote that as a little s. And that is the advantage that a mouse carrying the black gene has over mice without it. That's a relative measure of fitness. And that measure is a product of reproduction and survival. Okay, so if we put this in terms, if, if black mice in general produce, say, 101 survivors for every 100 mice produced by sandy colored mice, that's a 1% advantage, and we would write S as 0.01. You're about to see that 1% is plenty of advantage for evolution to work, for natural selection to work. And if there's a 5% advantage, okay, we'd write that as, as 0.05. Remember, just 101 to 100 compounded over time you're going to see how this works. Okay, so let's show this in, animated, in, in this animation. Consider the southwestern United States, sandy-colored landscape until some lava flows happen. That lava cools. And now that black rock is going to be invaded by the sandy-colored mice. Once every thousand years or so, a black mouse is going to pop up. The owls are going to be there circling overhead for eons. And if we start with a population where just one mouse is black and, we ne- and it has just a 1% advantage, watch what happens over the generations. Then in about 1,000 generations, 95% of the mice will be black. That's just natural selection doing the work. One mutation, one founding mutation can spread to 95% of the population in 1,000 generations. Now what happens if there's a 10% advantage of being black? Very quick. In 100 generations, 95% of the mice will be black. It turns out from measurements in the wild, there's an even greater than 10% advantage of mice being black on the black lava flows. So natural selection is very swift indeed, and the amount of time that we have when we're speaking on the geologic time scale for evolution to work is ample time for mutations to arise and for selection to spread favorable mutations throughout populations. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is that how long it takes for these for traits, to, traits to spread, it's a lot faster than most people realize. On the order for these things of maybe a century or a millennia. And you're going to hear a lot more examples about this in Dr. Kingsley's talk this morning. So you're going to understand more about the power of selection. It's, a, it's so powerful that our civilization depends upon it. And you'll see more about that from Dr. Kingsley. So it's raw material plus selection over time. That's the formula. And we see vivid evidence of natural selection working in all sorts of cases, both natural and artificial. So let's stop there. And I'll take some questions. In the back right. You're saying like how the mice like they evolve over time, like from a mutation. Like how does the mutation like even get there? So the question is, how does the mutation arise? Mutation is a completely random process. So as sperm and egg are produced for reproduction, there are errors made in the copying of DNA at random. These errors change the DNA code at random, and that creates random variation in genes. Some of those genes control fur color. I told you the example of one of those. So at a low rate, 1 in 25 million, there are mice born that look different than their parents in terms of fur coloration. But that is entirely a product of just the chemical nature of mutation that happens as the billions of sites in DNA are copied. In every generation of us, there's about 100 new mutations in you that were not in your parents, for example. Yeah? Um, the way you said that the, the white mice, it seemed like they have like, they're recessive to the black mice, but what if it had been the other way around? for the coat color in the mice? Okay, great question. And I'll get you, that's an overhand shot there for you. Um, the, uh, the question is, if, they were, if the black mice need to invade a sandy habitat, it's actually very easy to inactivate this gene so it doesn't work and that the mice are lightly pigmented. There's actually lots of ways you can mutate that gene, so the frequency of actually going black to white is even higher than it is from going white to black. And there are examples in nature of where this has happened. Um, For example, there are some bears on the northwest coast of Canada that are all white fur, and they have mutations in this gene that have inactivated it rather than make it form the black form. So there are, both directions are happening in the wild. And I can tell you that this same gene I'm telling you about is responsible for the black color phase of jaguars, 
for the black phase of snow geese, for the black phase of certain other types of cats, um, and for some black phases in domestic dogs. So this is a gene that has been called upon repeatedly to endow mammals with dark fur coloration. Yeah. Uh, my name is Chief. Um, you said with the homozygous, I mean, with the uh, black mouse, they can be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Uh, would the homozygous dominant ones be more prevalent just because the heterozygous ones could produce the sandy colored offspring? That's a great question. So the question is about whether it matters whether you carry one or two copies of the, of the gene. Is there any selective difference? It turns out there's a bit of an additive effect of, these, of the alleles. And so that the, the mice carrying two copies are a bit darker than one, those carrying one copy. That may be a selective advantage. So they, you may be still favoring the homozygote more than the heterozygote. But still, um, in order to really know that, we'd have to do pretty large population studies to, and, and genotype a whole lot of mice to understand the relative contribution of those two genotypes in the wild. Yeah, right there in front of the camera. Um, Sorry. I'll go with him in the front first. Yeah. The way you make it seem is that evolution happens as a coincidence. I mean, is there only black and white choice between the mice? I mean, say the environment had changed to like an orange color. Is it just these two types, or is it just a coincidence that the environment had turned black and there was a black mutation for the mice? I don't want to make it sound that there's a coincidence at all. The change in the environment, of course, is outside of the animal's control, okay? Um, but there are mutations that occur in populations. And if you look through this room at 200 humans and you consider our features that are visible, hair color, eye color, skin coloration, uh, facial features, et cetera, you see tremendous variation. If you had that sort of acuity in a mouse population, you'd also, if you, if you were looking at other mice, you'd say, well, there's a little bit of small variation here. You know, Fred's got a little bigger head, a little longer whiskers, a little taller ears, et cetera. So there's tremendous variation in populations. Now, the environment here the selective pressure is on fur coloration because of this setup between predator and background color. But if you want to say, well, look, what if the rocks were a little different color, like, say, tan or something like that, and, the, and it was the sandy soil was pure white, would there be advantage for being tan coloration, and could the mice evolve that color? And I'd say absolutely. Different sets of mutations, different selective process, but eventually, as this competition runs, if there's an advantage to a particular fur color scheme, this, will, this process will repeat itself again and again and again. So the coincidence, really, the mutations arise at random, but there's nothing random about selection. Selection is the conditions that the animal is living in and that either predators or, for example, mates uh, impose upon it. So I'm going to have to wrap up, but I'm happy to take some questions um, while we have a, a break, and we'll have many more opportunities to talk about uh, evolution and the process of natural selection over the next three lectures. Thank you, Sean Carroll, for getting our lectures on evolution off to a really great start. It's amazing to see how Darwin's insights continue to inform today's research. And thank you, students, for some really great questions. Now we're going to take a 30-minute break. When we resume, David Kingsley will focus in on this idea of the role of selection and how it plays into evolution.